Offertory Hymn is going to be number 189. So be turning there. Uh, Lucas, I'm going to ask you and Chris toward the end of this hymn to come up and collect the offering this morning. Um, let's all stand together and sing number 189. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Thank you, God, for the sunshine, and thank you for uh, this place, God, that we can come together and join together in worship and song. God, just uh, bless each and every one who's made the effort to come out this morning, and uh, God, just be with each and every one who, uh, for whatever reason, couldn't be here this morning. God, just uh, uh, send your spirit to them, give them comfort, and give them uh, what they need this morning. God, those who may be watching uh, the service online or whatever, just help them, God, to, uh, to worship you this morning in truth and in spirit. God, thank you now for this time of uh, offering. God, we just pray that you would take this offering and use it to further your kingdom, God. Just multiply it many times to reach out to this world and uh, to uh, reach others with your word and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. amen. amen.
Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? What a beautiful song this morning. You know, none of us have anything to boast in this morning outside of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we do have a lot to be thankful for. Amen? Amen. <coughs> you know, each and every day I get up counting my blessings. Every time I step in the pulpit, I, I thank God for a, another day to be able to deliver His Word and be able to look at a congregation and know that, that God is going to use you to win people to Christ. The only boast we have is what we do for Christ. That's the greatest thing we have. We have a lot of things in the world we can boast about. But being a servant of the Most High is one of the greatest honors that we have in our life this morning. You know, we're about to celebrate. I don't know about you, it's, it's my favorite holiday. I love Thanksgiving. A lot of people think, Preacher, you mean Christmas is not? Well, you know, Christmas today is not what really Christmas ought to be. 
we ought to really think hard about what Christmas is all about, more than about going shopping and, and having parties and doing all of the things that we do. I mean, it's all tradition. And you know, they're not sure on what day Christ was even born on. And we always celebrate it on the 25th of uh, December. But it's really, if you go back in history, nobody really knows for sure, but there is some speculation on it. So I try not to get into all of that. But we have Thanksgiving, which is not anything that we have to worry about going out and spending this money unless you're going to buy a turkey, which is kind of expensive now, amen? But nevertheless, it's a time of celebration. It's a time to, to be thankful to God. I mean, every day ought to be a Thanksgiving day. It really should. And uh, I want to read you a little story before I get into the Scripture this morning. I, I found it quite hilarious, and, and, and I am just blessed this morning to be able to be with you here at Thanksgiving time and uh, be able to share a, a message with you. And while the choir is coming out to take their seat, I don't want them to really miss anything. Uh, but I, I do want them to hear this story because it's a, a really unique story about Thanksgiving. And so the day before Thanksgiving, an elderly man in Phoenix called his son in New York. And he said to him, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you that your mother and I are divorcing. Forty-five years of misery is enough. We're sick of each other, and so you call your sister in Chicago and tell her, frantic, that the son called his sister, who exploded on the phone, like heck you're going to get a divorce, she shouted. I'll take care of this. She called Phoenix immediately and said to her father, you're not getting a divorce. Don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back, and we'll both be there tomorrow. Till then, don't do a thing. Do you hear me? The man hung the phone up, turned to his wife, said, Okay, honey, the kids are coming for Thanksgiving and paying for their flights. <laughs> How do you like that one? <laughs> honey, we ought to try that sometime, you know. <laughs> we, we've got children live all over. We ought to just try that sometime. But, you know, every time I think about that story, I'm going, wow, how precious is Thanksgiving. So remember, remember your parents at Thanksgiving, young people. Don't ever forget how much love they have for you. You know, God has given us so many scriptures in the Bible that I could preach on about giving thanks. Tonight, I'm going to come back again. I'm going to actually share with you another Thanksgiving message. You're going to be sick of Thanksgiving time. I get done preaching probably. But I don't think we can talk about thanks to God enough. I really don't. But in Psalms 118, I want you to turn there with me. Psalms 118 is one of the greatest scriptures because it's a very unique scripture. It's a scripture that deals with praising confession. Have you ever heard that terminology? Praising confession. Now, it's very unusual to see this in the Bible, but to know about it and know that in the Hebrew and what's happening at the temple area is called praise and confession. And David is one that had a lot to be thankful for. He was a man, the Bible says, after God's own heart. And when we read this, you're going to get a, a real good feeling about what God has really done for us and how that we ought to celebrate Thanksgiving. Now, this year, I, I've already told my family, you're going to get Scripture read to you at Thanksgiving. We're going to have a time to give thanks to God. It's going to be like a worship service in my home. They're looking forward to that. We can't wait to be together. We're going to have about 17 or 18 people in our home. And I'm going to be just so tickled to be able to, they need preaching to. <laughs> I'm going to give them a little bit of a, a message come this Thanksgiving may surprise them all. Stand with me for the reading of God's Word, beginning in verse 1. Now, I want you to read this first verse with me out loud, okay? Are you ready? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good because His mercy endureth forever. Now, I want you to read it back to me. Because his mercy endures forever. 
Do you believe that? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read the rest of it. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me, set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with him that helped me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better. Now I want you to listen to this verse. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in princes. I, I like to change that to the government. Now let me read that again. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in the government. It fits, doesn't it? I, I think it's really a good translation when we look at it and think about all that we trust. And notice that mercy in this scripture is mentioned three times. The Lord is merciful. Aren't you glad? Why don't you just thank him for it right now as we pray. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy and your grace. We thank you that we can put all of our trust in you and not in man. And Lord, that standing here this morning, Lord, we can trust you more than we can even trust our government. We can trust you, Lord, more than we can trust our wives. We can trust you more than we can trust our children. We can trust you more than we can trust ourselves. Lord, I'll, I want to just put my trust in you, Lord, and you alone this morning, thanking you and praising you for the precious gift of salvation in our lives. And knowing, dear Lord, that you're our great protector, you're watching over us even this morning as we, we stand in this place. And so, Lord, we just want to lift our hands to you and give all thanks and glory and honor to you for all that you've done in our lives, all you're going to do in our lives, and what you're going to do in the future for us. We are looking forward to spending glory with you, giving thanks to you, dear Heavenly Father, throughout all eternity. And everyone said, Amen and amen. Please be seated. I'm a little excited this morning. I'm a little excited about celebrating Thanksgiving. You know, my friends, if you really think about what I've said this morning, it can change your life. In other words, Thanksgiving can change your life. It can change it because of confidence in God. Confidence in God's eternal love. The word mercy in some translations is translated love. Think about that. Go, you can go back and see it. Because his love endures forever. Because his mercy endures forever. You say his love endures forever. Even Israel knew that. Let the house of Aaron now say his love endureth forever. Let them now fear the Lord that his love endureth forever. Do you love the Lord this morning? Say amen. amen. Man, I love the Lord. I love him with all my heart, with the deepest part of my life. And I'm proud that I can say and not be ashamed that, that I love the Lord. I love the Lord more than I love my wife. And I love my wife more than anything just about, but not the Lord. Because I can't love her properly till I love the Lord properly. That's the way it goes, man. I, I love the Lord more than I love my children and my grandchildren, and I love them. I pray for them. But let me tell you something, folks. We need to learn to love the way God loves, with an unending love. We need to learn to give thanks to God. You know, the theme of this scripture, when you really look at it, it's confidence in God's eternal love. God's love is unchanging. I want to tell you that. In the midst of all the changing situations that's going to happen in your life, God's love is unchanging. And what it says to me when I read the scripture is God gives me security. Wow. I have security in God's love. No matter what the conditions are and the circumstances are in my life this morning, I have a security with that. Because his mercy and his love endureth, the Bible says, forever. 
It's not about changing condition. It's not about circumstances. It's about understanding that God's love never changes. Verse 5 says, call upon the Lord in distress. We're living in the most stressful world that we could ever live in. In times of stress, we get up every day. I look at our economy. I, I look at how much money it takes just to pay utilities and, and pay your living expenses. But go to the grocery store. Man, I wanted to walk out of a grocery store this week. I couldn't believe the prices. And I'm going, Lord, give me patience. I'd like to go talk to the manager of this place because I know he's jacking up prices. You can tell it. You know, and, and so we're living in a very distressful world. And that's what the Bible is talking about here. And the Lord answered me according to what David said. He said, he sent me in a large place. You know, when I look at this, I think about what David is going through, what David is experienced with the Lord. But he said, the Lord is on my side. How many of you got the Lord on your side this morning? Say amen. amen. Whew, man, aren't you glad you got the Lord on your side? You don't know what you're going to face tomorrow. God holds tomorrow. And I've got the Lord on my side. I love the, the, the psalmist said, The Lord taketh my part with them that helpeth me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. You know, I'm sure that David had a, a lot of enemies. We read the Bible. We go into stories of David. We know that people tried to kill David. They, they hated David. A man after God's own heart, they hated him. You know, there's a lot of people after God's own heart that's hated. That's part of the world we live in today. You as a Christian, let me tell you something this morning. You as a Christian this morning, there are many people in the world today that hate you because of that. They hate you. And David said, that, but you know, don't be so worried about all of that because my Lord endureth forever. My Lord is enduring. My Lord is, is merciful. My Lord is in love with me. And the king, we find David the king, he demanded. He demanded that the gates of the temple be left open. I like that. You go into the scripture. I'll jump over to verse 19 of that text. And it says, open to me the gates of of righteousness, I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. Aren't you glad if I'd have got here this morning, those doors have been locked, cold as it is? I'd have to went back to my truck, got back in the truck, waited for them to. Aren't you glad the doors are open and you can walk into a, a warm place? But why did we come here this morning? We came to praise God, didn't we? We came to give God all the glory and honor for what God is doing in our lives. You don't come because you want to be seen. You don't come because you're feeling guilty. You don't come but for one thing, and that is to give God praise and glory and honor. And David said, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Look at that. That's awesome. So, Thanksgiving. On Thursday, we will be all gathered together with our family. And hopefully we will remember to do more than just eat a meal, watch a football game, make a mad dash somewhere to go shopping when it's all over with. Walmart doors will be open, I grant you. They'll be waiting to get your dollar. And the Thanksgiving holiday, to me, gives us the perfect opportunity to transform our lives from those of gripping and dissatisfaction to lives of joy and gratitude. That's what Thanksgiving's all about. Thanksgiving to me is a good holiday. It's a good holiday for us to turn the corner and become more grateful as God's people than we ever have before. I wonder in America if we really think hard about why is Thanksgiving celebrated before Christmas? Is it to get us thankful and get us ready to celebrate the birth of Christ? It should help us to understand that Thanksgiving is, is a holiday that helps us to think about Thanksgiving. The psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. 
And so, friends, every time I see this, that's that confession. It's a praising confession. And so David understood that in the Scripture. He understood that it was so important that the doors of the temple be left open so people have the opportunity to come in and praise God. I'm thankful today that still in America we can have our doors of our churches open. I believe for me, when I, when I think about Thanksgiving, I think about being a grateful person and it ought to increase our happiness. You know, so many Christians are not happy people. They're not. Because we allow the circumstances of life. See, we should be happy about what God says. And, and I can say that because the Bible says rejoice. Now look down verse 24 and watch this. You've got a lot going on in your life. So do I. We do in this world that we're living in. It's going to be hectic. It's going to be frustrating. We're going to have pain. We're going to have sorrow. We're even going to have death. So you can't allow everyday circumstances in the situation that you're in right now to keep you from not praising God. You have losses in your life. It can be a loss of health. It can be a loss of a friend. It can be a loss of wealth. And I could go on and on about all of your losses. We could stack them up. And here's where people get depressed. You can stack up all of your losses. When I've gone into counseling with people that's been depressed, and when I was working mental health, I tried to help people unstack. And, and I would go through a whole list of things that they were very depressed about. And I'd write them on a piece of paper, and I'd draw a little block. And I'd get, finally, I'd have a huge pyramid of things that they were depressed about, the things that they were hurting about. And I said, now we're going to unstack each one of them. And we start unstacking them and talking about them and, and talking about how to deal with them, what you could do about them. And then finally they start to see that they've stacked all of these losses up in their life and they're having a hard time dealing with it. They can't get rid of it. And then I would go to the scripture here in verse 24. Look at it. This is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be what? Did that say anything about a bad day? This is the day. Are you still alive? I want to hear you say amen if you're still alive. Amen. This is the day. If you're alive, it's a day you need to rejoice because you are alive. Because you have an opportunity to repent of your sins. You have an opportunity to love with all of your heart. Enjoy the endurance of God's love in your life. Be able to share love with other folks in your life. Be thankful for what you have regardless of your circumstances. We've all gone through things with our health. And some days we get up and we don't feel like doing anything but taking a pill. I don't know about you, I get sick of taking pills. Got to come a day, I'll never take another pill. I'm thankful, I'd be thankful for that when I get up. If I'm having issues with health, I try to unstack that, say this is the day, this is the day which the Lord hath made. I'm going to be thankful in it, Lord, because there's going to come a day this old body ain't going to ache, it ain't going to have no more pain. I'm going to have a new body. I'm going to look better than Arnold Schwarzenegger ever looked. Man, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to be running faster than anybody that ever ran. I, I'm going to have a, me a spell when I get to heaven. The Lord's going to say, somebody catch that fool. He's going crazy. There ain't nothing like going crazy for the Lord, amen. Man, we have so much to be thankful for. You know, we've been taught that our happiness is somehow dependent on how how well things go with us. If you depend on how well things go for you tomorrow, you're going to be like somebody baptized in dill pickle juice. You're going to have a frown on your face. You're not going to be good for anything but to bring sorrow to somebody else. But really our happiness is determined by our attitude. Our attitude. It's really in how that we see, see things. The, listen to me. The apostle Paul, that man was beaten and battered, locked up, shipwrecked. He went through everything. He was thrown in prison. 
And you know what he wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4? Rejoice in the Lord always, he wrote. And again, I say, rejoice. That man was a lunatic, wasn't he? For the Lord. He was a lunatic for the Lord. He was crazy for Jesus. He knew what God had waiting for him, and he believed every word of it. And he could sit in a prison cell and write, I'm going to rejoice. Woo! Clap your hand. Praise God, I'm locked up. You know what I just believe? He was rejoiced because he had opportunities, and the Bible tells us that he witnessed to people and led people to Jesus Christ while he was in a prison cell. All about perspective. All about perspective. Paul was happy despite being in prison and how he learned to thank God in everything he did. He was really a man that had the right perspective of life. Let me tell you about perspective. You need a godly perspective in your life. Through the years working with people in mental health, I used to take them through a chart that dealt with perspective. And, and a lot of times I'd tell them, I said, now you get up every day and you've got all this power and you've got all this energy and you've got the ability to make decisions. But if you don't have the right perspective, it, and I've had people come to me and say, well, I'm going through so much in my life and I need to change. I, I've got addiction problems and, and I, I need to make sure I, I do what I need to do. I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. How much energy are you really putting in your perspective of your life and what's happening around you? And they say, well, so-and-so, I, I, I need to do something. I can't deal with this issue. And I'm going, wait a minute. What issues are you talking about? What perspective do you have to that issue? Do you realize that you're not going to change anybody? You put all the energy you want to change in people, but let me tell you what happens. When the perspective comes back to you and you change yourself and how you deal with things, what does that do to somebody else to change? It helps them to change. What's it going to do for you if you don't change your perspective and you try to change your behavior? I've never seen an alcoholic, a drug-addicted person, ever recover from anything until they change their perspective of life. If they thought they could change themselves, they find out down the road somewhere when they've hit the bottom they can't do anything to change himself without a spiritual perspective about their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, with a God that endureth in mercy and love forever, and God is there for you to help you to make that change in your life. But your perspective, everybody goes through something in life. I see a lot of people become alcoholics and drug abusers because they don't know how to deal with life. And they've got the wrong perspective about life. And so what do they do? They go out here and drown all their sorrows in a bottle, in a bottle. And I tell an alcoholic, I'll say to him, what are you really thankful for? Are you thankful for God? Are you thankful that you're alive? Are you thinking that bottle for your life? Are you living for that little bit of liquid? You letting that liquid in that bottle run your life? Boy, you don't want to come for me for counseling. I'll lay it on you. Because we do some of the stupidest things in our thought and our perspective about things in our life. Perspective is everything. Perspective would change everything. And so, you know, I'm going to give you another story about perspective. I want you to think about it. A young woman wrote her mother from college. Dear Mom, sorry I haven't written sooner. My arm really has been broke. I broke it and my left leg too. When I jumped from the second floor of my dormitory when it was on fire. We were lucky. A young serviceman came along that was a station attendant. He saw the blaze, called the fire department. They, they were there just in a few minutes. I was in the hospital for a few days. Paul, the service station attendant, came to see me every day. And because it was taking so long to get our dormitory livable again, I moved in with him. He has been so nice. I must admit that I am pregnant. Paul and I plan to get married just as soon as he can get a divorce. I hope things at home are fine. I'm doing fine and will write more when I get a chance. Love you, daughter Susie. P.S. Mom, none of the above is true, but I did get a C in sociology and I flunked chemistry. 
I just wanted you to receive the news in a proper perspective. <laughs> perspective is everything. Happiness really is determined by our perspective in life, not our circumstances. If you learn to be grateful people despite circumstances, that will greatly improve your happiness this morning. It will greatly improve your happiness. See, being a grateful person always improves our witness for Christ. Our witness for Christ through Thanksgiving, through the holidays. Don't live for the circumstances and the situations you're going to be faced with. Having a noticeable countenance of thankfulness and joy will make a difference in your witness for Christ even before your family. I don't know about you. Sometimes being with family sometimes can just be depressing. Am I saying the truth here this morning? It can just be depressing. You're going, well, so-and-so's got these problems. Ain't Susie's got this. My sister's got this. Your sister and your brother's got that. And, and we're going through all of the negative things. And we're sharing with each other all of our hurts and all of our pains and all of that. Why don't we share with each other this Thanksgiving? Our blessings. Why don't we share our blessings? Why don't we turn to the person next to you and say, I've been blessed? Turn to the person next to you and say, I've been blessed. If you hadn't been blessed, say, Oh, me, I need a blessing. You know, but you ought to be able to say, I've been blessed. And you ought to be able to talk about the blessings of life. And you know, if you ever look at the world today, you'll see how discouraged people really are. But the Bible says that we have something. They don't have. Second, no, yeah, First Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glory God on the day he visits us. Live among the pagans. You bunch of pagans. Live among the pagans and live your life that people see God through you, basically is what this is saying. Live a life of thanksgiving, what he's saying, that will attract the pagans, that will attract the lost. Christians, if you're not living that way, you're not attracting anybody to church. You want to build your church. You want your church with your new pastor to flourish. Start living like you're a thankful Christian. And live it among the people that you're around in this community. They're going, that people are crazy up there at that church. <laughs> they're always laughing and smiling. And they're wanting to help me all the time. They're wanting to, to tell me about Jesus. Maybe I'll just go up there. I want to be with some happy people. But if people look at this church and every other church and community saying, man, all them people up there, they're sad. That preacher must be beating them to death. They're not happy about anything. All they do is complain. All, all they do is, is talk about the negative. I don't know if I ever told you a story, but if I did, I'd tell you again. My memory ain't that good, so probably I did. But in eastern Kentucky, there was a preacher. I knew him quite well. He was in the Barberville area. Great revivals were breaking out. I had a revival in my church there. Baptized, I don't know how many people, man. It was unbelievable. Every church was seeing revival. We'd go from church to church having revival. And this one particular church, I'm not going to call its name, was flourishing. I mean, folks, we had camp meetings over there. And people, preachers were coming in from all over to preach. And man, we, it was just a revival went on for months. And one of the church members was in a store. The pastor told me the story. And he said that... Uh, this woman overheard another woman talking to a woman about how bad that church was. She didn't like what was going on in that church. She was putting the church down, putting the pastor down. The woman walks up to her, looks her right in the face and says, spit on me. Spit on me. The woman looked at her and said, excuse me, lady, I'm not going to spit on you. She said, well, you've been spitting on my pastor and you've been spitting on my church. So you might as well spit on me. She apologized. The woman had a talk with her and invited her to church. 
My friends, I want to tell you, that's the kind of world we live in. It's the kind of world that people are waiting to see somebody that has a thanksgiving about something that's proud to be a Christian, proud to be part of God's relationship. See, being a grateful person will also enhance your relationship. And there's one thing I've noticed about even married couples nowadays. So we have so many marital problems. After a while, many of them become ungrateful and unappreciative of their, their spouses over time. And we go to having a lot of marriage problems. We wonder why we have so many marriage problems. Somebody described the first years in a marriage like this. The husband seeing his wife, and she had a cold, and she wasn't feeling well. And he said, you don't look good, honey. You should go to the hospital. I have already arranged it. I know the food is bad there, but we're going to have meals catered in. The second year of their marriage, he says when she got sick, you don't look so good. I have called the doctor, go and lay down. I will take care of the kids. The doctor will be right over. The third year of their marriage, when she got sick, he said, you know, you're not looking so hot. When you're done feeding the kids and cleaning up the kitchen, you ought to go lay down. Their fourth year of their marriage, he said, would you quit walking around barking like a seal? You're going to give me that cold. The longer we become familiar, you see, the less thankful we are for each other. I hope that's not your marriage. We ought to think every day how thankful we ought to be for one another. And husbands, imagine how much your marriage would be improved if you came home one day with flowers and just told your wife that you were thankful. You might give her a heart attack if you did that, but she'd be very thankful for it. Wives, just think about how much your marriage would improve if you told your husband how much you appreciate him once in a while. Kids, think about how much better things would go for you in your home if you told your mom and dad how grateful you are for the money they spend on you, the sacrifices they've given for you, and the stuff that you've enjoyed having throughout your life. And thank them for the things they've done for you and the things they're going to continue to do for you. Do you know the Apostle Paul began most of his letters? Let me share something with you before I close. The Apostle Paul is my example I want to give you this morning. That's so important. He wrote letters to every church. And most of them was written from prison. Now, here's what he said. You might want to write these down. To the church in Rome, he wrote, First, I thank my God for all of you. Romans 1.8. You see that? He's praying. He's thanking them. To the church in Corinth, he said, I always thank God for you. 1 Corinthians 1.4. To the church in Ephesus, he said, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you, in my prayers, Ephesians 1.16. The church in Philippi, I thank my God every time I remember you, Philippians 1.3. To the church in Colossae, I always thank God when I pray for you, Colossians 1.3. Now you can go back and look at that. What does that say? Paul's making sure that he let people in the churches know that he was thankful for them. So church, what I'm saying to you this morning is, you need to be thankful for each other. And you need to be thanking each other. You need to be thanking your new pastor for the sacrifice he's making to come to you and the change and the transition he's going to go through. And I just believe if you're thankful enough to each other, other people will see this thankfulness and they'll like to be thanked too. And they'll come and they'll change. And so I tell you another way of having a grateful heart. And I think it will solidify your relationship with God. Someone once said that God lives in two places. He lives in heaven and he lives in a humble heart. He lives in heaven and he lives in a humble heart. Say, preacher, how do you know that? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. And I'm going to close with this. 
the Bible says, let us please God by serving Him with what? A thankful heart. That's where God lives. Are you thankful this morning? Say amen. amen. I'm thankful for you, and I love you. And I'm going to keep praying for you, not just while I'm in this pulpit, but when I'm out of this pulpit, Fairview Baptist Church will be on my heart always praying for you. Let's pray together. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for this time that we have spent together in worship, a time of praise and confession. God, we all confess this morning, Lord, that we just don't praise you enough. Help us to take our life, give it to you in a praise confession, and ask you each day to help us to have a proper spiritual perspective about things that are happening around us. Help us to remember others and be thankful for them. Help us to, to enjoy this Thanksgiving holiday this year more than we ever have before because, Lord, we don't know when we'll be able to celebrate another one. But, Lord, I, I want to thank you no matter what goes on in my life and let me be reminded of what I've preached today. And, Lord, we just once again praise you and we pray, dear Lord, if there's someone here today that's thankful enough that your son died for them, they'll walk this aisle and come and give their heart to Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. So it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together for a hymn of invitation. <laughs>